we're in an early JK. We'll talk a little bit about this swap, but I think I want to try to cover some of the questions I get often regarding the conversion. You'll notice that on this dash that there is a check engine light on and ESP off. ESP off is being displayed because this customer did the steering wheel dance. A lot of you may not be familiar with that, but way back in 2008, 2009, Jeep figured out that modified vehicles had a problem with the electronic stability program, or ESP. Basically, the feedback from the wheel speed sensors were not correct and correlated perfectly with the steering angle sensor. Inside of the steering wheel is a steering angle sensor, and it knows to within one degree or less, even more precision, what angle the steering wheel is at, and then it compares that to the wheel speed sensors. If you're going straight down the road, of course, the wheel speed sensors are gonna be reading exactly the same value. If you're crabbing or you have an alignment problem, that could exaggerate the problem. If you have larger or oversized tires and you did not correct your speedometer, that can exaggerate the problem. Bottom line is, you could be getting off an off-ramp and have ESP engaged prematurely and that, that could be a dangerous situation. So Chrysler did offer this ESP bypass. It's called the steering wheel dance by most guys because you basically turn the steering wheel and press the button on the dash to bypass it. Other JK owners will add a switch. Basically they'll interrupt the signal of the dynamic sensor which is under the console and when you interrupt that it basically turns off all ESP and of course your dash turns into a Christmas tree. We've got the check engine light on for a reason and we're going to look at that here in a second. A lot of guys ask me, do I need to get a scan gauge or an Aeroforce interceptor or a dash DAC or whatever? No, you don't have to. I like having an Aeroforce gauge or one of the other higher end scan tools because it adds a lot of functionality. You can read codes, clear codes, you can do bi-directional controls or tests like reset your crank variation and we're going to talk about that in a second. But if you don't want to get an expensive mount on the dash gauge, go ahead and get yourself a Bluetooth adapter. Now this happens to be torque. I've got it opened up on my phone and you can see here's the data I'm looking at right now. Here's our coolant temp and our intake temp. Notice that I have speed on the top being read from the GM computer and GPS speed in the bottom. This way I can accurately correct the vehicle speed driving down the road. All I have to do is look at the error. And there's actually a parameter in torque that shows just the errors. Here's a long-term fuel trims. Long-term fuel trims are really important because they're basically the culmination of everything that's going on in the operating system. You want to see the long-term fuel trims as close to zero as possible. They'll never always be zero unless you turn off the adaptives. However, you don't want to really do that. Now, this, this vehicle really doesn't have a whole lot of miles on it, so it's still going through its learning process. It takes a little bit of time for the computer to to learn the long-term adaptives and basically the long-term adaptives are the culmination of short-term fuel trim. So as you're driving along many many times a second the computer is making corrections for fuel and it's not doing it using a lookup table like in the old days, the old block learn. This is a coefficient based operating system so it's using dozens and dozens of coefficients. Intake air temperature, intake manifold vacuum, vehicle speed and it's multiplying them together on the fly to come up with a fuel strategy. If that fuel strategy is right on the money, you're going to see these long-term fuel trims at zero. If it's not, they're going to be corrected, and they're going to be corrected through these fuel trims, the short terms and then the long term. So if you can get anywhere near zero, you're doing really good. Plus or minus five is actually really good. Plus or minus ten is actually very acceptable. What happens with the fuel trims is, is when you fill the gas up, let's say in your tank, and you go to a different grade of fuel, those fuel trims are going to change. If you go from sea level and then climb a mountain to five or six thousand feet, the barometric pressure is going to change quite a bit, and that again is going to change your fuel trims. As is temperature, if you go from 70 degrees to 105 degrees in the same drive, you're going to see those fuel trims are constantly trying to keep the oxygen sensor switching at or near stoichiometric when you're in closed loop. So 2% is really good. This thing will learn as I drive it over the next couple of tanks of fuel. This is the monitors and you can see these are onboard monitors. Onboard monitors are very important because onboard diagnostics means that the diagnostics for the vehicle have been put into the operating system. This information can be retrieved by a mechanic or a tech. There's freeze frame data so you can look at what happened when the event happened. Let's say it through a check engine light. These monitors will set eventually. 
Uh, now you have many pages in Torque, and I don't have them all set. So let's go back to obviously coolant temp and air intake temp. Here you can see our fuel level and our system voltage. Now this system voltage is being sensed at the ECM. This, this may not be the same voltage that you're going to see at the alternator because this is going through a bunch of wiring through the engine control module. So it's, it's called control module voltage. If you look there it says CM. 14 volts is really good. We do run smart charging in our swap. So the TIPM is controlling the charge goal and the PCM is controlling the actual fuels of the alternator. Now if you look at the bottom you'll see fuel level and or fuel percent remaining and that's kind of important because when you want to set your monitors you want to be running between 25 and 75 percent fuel. Actually I like to run about 50 percent. Some of the monitors like the EVAP monitor may not run if your fuel level is too low or too high. So you want to try to keep that that number about 50 percent. Another thing about the fuel level is when you fill up the operating system knows that the fuel has been changed and it can go back and modify some of the adaptives. If you run the same gas all the time, there's no problem. If you're driving through Utah and you're running 85 octane, then you get into Nevada and you run 90 octane, and then you get into California and you run oxygenated California fuel, these fuel trims can have a really hard time keeping up. And a lot of times, even on new vehicles, you'll see a check engine light go off for a lean or a rich condition. And basically what it is, is the adaptives have not responded quick enough or have reached their adaptive limit, which is usually about 25 or 30 percent. So if you see these adaptives hit 25, 30 percent, there's something wrong. Either you get an air leak, you get a plug injector, you get a fuel pump going bad, or in many cases I've seen guys put in alcohol. So if you put in alcohol, which likes to run at a much lower stoic point, somewhere in the 9 to 1 range versus pure gasoline at 14.7, of course the operating system's not going to know. Now the newer vehicles do have flex fuel sensors and some of them have virtual sensors. So let's get back to this check engine light. I left it on on purpose because there's really nothing wrong with this vehicle. It runs just fine. We're going to go back and we're going to see what this code is. Now by getting torque, torque is only a $5 or $6 purchase on the Android store and they actually have a, a free version too. So it doesn't cost very much and the adapter, you can get the Bluetooth adapter off eBay for I've seen them as low as $5 and probably the high end is $10. So there's no excuse not to have this. You take tools on the trail to fix your tires and mechanical failures, get some kind of scanner. And I don't care if you have an LS, a Hemi, a supercharger, or just a stock Jeep. If that check engine light goes off, you want to know what it is. Now you see here I have a PO315. I get this question a lot. A lot of guys will finish their swap and they'll call me up and they'll say, hey, I got a PO315, I changed the crank sensor out, I checked the wires and I can't find anything wrong, my Jeep runs fine. Well, the reason is, is this really isn't a, a valid code. What PO315 is, is crank variation not learned. Way back in 1996, the feds required misfire detection for onboard diagnostics because we, we needed to know what cylinder was misfiring so that we could deal with it. Shut off the, the fuel injector, that's why we went to sequential fuel injection because if you have a cylinder misfiring you don't want to be pumping fuel into it and in the early days we had no, no way of doing that because if you were just running programmable fuel injection or continuous fuel injection the fuel was going to continue to go into the bad cylinder. So in 1996 the Fed said we have to have a way of identifying which cylinder is misfiring and then be able to deal with it, whether we shut off the fuel, change the spark, whatever. It's a called a failure mode. So in the early days, the vehicles that had distributors like the old Chevy V8s, what they did is they added a top dead center sensor inside the distributor. And that combined with a very primitive crank sensor could tell the computer where it was in the combustion cycle. And remember, it's 720 degrees through the, through the full four-stroke cycle, and it could determine which cylinder was misfiring based on that. Of course, as time went on, we went distributor lists, and then we went to multiple coil packs, and we got really advanced to the point that these engines are almost eight single-cylinder engines, and spark and fuel can be controlled independently and shut off if need be, if a, if a fault is detected. So we needed a more accurate way of determining what cylinder is misfiring and better fuel control. So by going to a higher count trigger wheel, we're running basically a 60 tooth trigger wheel on these engines for the crankshaft position and we're running pretty complex patterns on the camshaft sensors. So these operating systems can tell where this engine is in the combustion process. By doing that we have really good fuel control, really good spark control, really good misfire detection. Well part of that is 
the crankshaft pattern. Every engine is not going to have exactly the same crankshaft pattern. So what this does, what this 315 is telling you is this crankshaft pattern has not been learned by the computer. You basically are going to do a procedure, which we're going to do back at the shop, where you're going to floor the engine, you're going to put it into a mode, you're going to floor the throttle, and the operating system is going to take a picture of the crankshaft pattern. And then it's going to use that picture to reference for misfire detection. So it's going to look at the actual real live data and it's going to compare it to the learned data. And by doing that, it's going to get a more accurate picture of misfire detection. So really all this code is saying is learn the crankshaft variation. The, the, the computer needs to take a picture so it has some point of reference for misfire detection. Now most good scan gauges can do it, most good scanners can do it. Autel, Snap-on, Genesis, uh, OTC, whatever. However, the cheaper scanners are not going to do it. If you buy a $40 handheld from AutoZone, it's not going to do it. You're going to need to get a scanner or some kind of device to do your crank variation learn. And it's pretty simple to do. Obviously, if you have the battery disconnected for a long period of time, it may lose its memory and have to have that relearn. We're going to set the crank variation in this Jeep, and I'm going to show you how. It is a little bit warm here in Vegas, so I have the air conditioning on, and that is going to become important here in a minute. This Jeep does have the Camaro SS fan. I don't know if you can hear it speeding up and slowing down with AC condenser pressure, but that's pretty cool. Okay, so this is a high-end scanner. You do not need to use a high-end scanner to do this. The Aeroforce Interceptor will do it. Most of the Snap-ons, OTCs, all those uh, medium and higher-end scanners will do it. Now, a scanner or a code reader from AutoZone probably will not do it. Let's go into Diagnosis, Control Unit. And yes, I have the Elder Wand, Engine Control Module, Special Functions, and that menu is pretty much the same in most scan uh, scanners. Crankshaft Variation Learn, right here. Some call it a case learn. What it's telling us here is that we're going to floor it, and the engine RPM should cut out at this specific RPM. So on a passenger truck, it should be about 4,000 RPM. If the engine continues to rev past 4,000 RPM, let off. Something went wrong. There are several constraints like coolant temperature, being in park, brake on, or the crank variation will not learn. A lot of guys call me and say, hey, my crank variation won't learn. You have to look at these inhibitors. One of the inhibitors is having engine codes. So if you have any engine codes, like for a camshaft position sensor or something, you're not going to be able to set your crank variation. So let's continue. Engine acceleration should not exceed the calibrated RPM value. We already talked about that. So, block the drive wheels, set the parking brake, which I'm going to do now. I'm not going to cycle the ignition in this case because I find it's not necessary. Apply and hold the brake pedal down. Now we're going to turn off the air conditioning. Make sure the vehicle's in park and continue. Once we get this message here, accelerate to wide open throttle, that means everything is ready. Our coolant temp and now some of the other gauges and scanners like the Aeroforce is not going to give you these instructions. It's basically going to put it into the learn mode and you kind of got to know how to do it. Especially uh, EFI Live and HP tuners are not really good about telling you how to do it. But this scanner is telling us how to do it so we're going to follow the, uh, the directions here. Now I'm going to floor this thing to wide open throttle and you're going to see that that tack go up pretty quick and you see that the check engine it, light is on right now. Let's see what happens when I floor it. Notice the light went out and it says learned status, learn this ignition. Press escape. So we have now learned the crank variation and our check engine lights off. Let's go back to trouble code. So we're going to look for codes. Now you'll see that 3015 is still in the computer's memory. But notice here it says it's in history. 
What that means is we have not cycled the ignition. So it passed and it failed this ignition cycle, as you can see here, and it's stored in history. So if we want to get rid of it completely, let's go back and we're just going to erase it. Now it's out of memory. And if we look here, we have no more check engine lights. The only thing we have on is ESP, and that's because that's been bypassed. Get on the way here. An L94 is basically the truck SUV version of an LS3. All aluminum, 6.2. The L94 does have variable valve timing and air fuel management, and it's also capable of flex fuel. The L92, which is the 2007-8 version of this engine, did not have flex fuel, did not have air fuel management, but it did have VVT. The L9H in 2009, when it was released, added flex fuel, but again, no AFM. We have really come to like variable valve timing, and the reason is, if you get an LS3, you have no variable valve timing, and it's an excellent engine. The engine's about as simple as you can get. Overhead valve, there is no AFM lifters, there is no variable valve timing, but there's less parts to go wrong. So that's why it's such a popular engine. The LS3 does run higher compression to get cylinder pressure for its power. So it's running basically a fixed cam that has a more aggressive profile. That more aggressive profile means that the power band in the LS3 is slightly higher, but having 6.2 liters doesn't mean the LS3 has no bottom end. It has quite a bit of bottom end. When you get the LS3 into its power band, which is about 3,000 RPM, they really start to pull hard, and they pull hard right up through the red line, similar to an old muscle car. Anybody that's driven an old muscle car would understand. You put a big cam in it, you start losing bottom end, you start gaining top end. What VVT does is it allows us to regain some of that bottom end back. By advancing the cam on the bottom and retarding the cam on the top, it widens our power range. So that means we can get better bottom end torque in these heavy JKs and still maintain good top end. And these 6.2 truck engines, and I'm gonna talk about the L99 in a second, are really a great motor for the JK because having that variable valve timing means we can push that torque on the bottom and then still have good top end power. You are pretty much limited to the intake on these, which is about 6,000, 6,200 RPM, but that's really all you need. Um, especially in the AFM motors, I would not go more. The AFM motors have lifters that really don't like to be revved too high, and they're pretty sensitive to oil pressure. Now, if we back off to the passenger car motor, everybody talks about the LS3, but the kind of lost engine is the L99. The LS3 came in the manual transmission vehicles. Again, it's very simple, and we know all about the LS3. The L99 is similar to this engine in that it has variable valve timing and air fuel management, and they put it behind the automatic transmission vehicles. So the L99 makes an excellent engine for the JK also. You get a little more bottom end than the LS3. You probably don't get quite the top end that the LS3 has, but with good tuning, it makes an excellent engine. The variable valve timing engines in general have less compression, not much.